here at Distributech 2023, one of the sponsors of these interviews, and these are interviews with thought leaders from around North America and the globe. Uh, our sponsors are H2 Scan. H2 Scan is uh, the leading sensor uh, manufacturer for hydrogen sensing uh, in a lot of different applications and transformers in uh, battery room safety, in uh, processes in safety and in industrial, and in the future hydrogen economy. So I wanna thank our sponsors and I wanna thank all of our guests. And I hope you enjoy this interview. Hi, my guest on this segment is Dave Myers. Dave is the CEO of H2Scan. H2Scan is one of our sponsors, uh, as you can see on the, the slide. They are advanced hydrogen sensing, absolutely the best at it in the world. Um, and you can see an interview with Dave on their website. We'll put, a, we'll put the link onto this. But Dave, I want to thank you for coming and talk about thank you, the future. Alan. The We're future. going to talk about the future of the power industry. Right. Um, H2 Scan is involved in a lot of different things. You're involved in industrial, but you're also heavily involved in the power industry through transformer monitoring, battery room safety, a lot of other areas. <clears throat> when you look at the power industry, because you've been in it long enough to have a, a, an opinion about what the biggest challenges are. So what if I'm a utility, what are the biggest challenges I'm facing? Well, there's, there's I mean, I think right now it's more about supply of materials. I mean, and you know, transformers, uh, line, a bunch of things that are causing challenges that when that when that timeline shifted so dramatically recently, you know, how do you plan for that? What do you do? How do you address it? I think to me that's where I think certainly would be a concern. And then what about your staff, right? How do you have trained people? We have the graying out of the baby boomers and those people and you had the 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 uh, attraction of all the sort of I'll call it you know high tech companies that pulled a lot of talent out of this industry. So how do you how do you solve get people engaged back in the industry to support it, the support the growth? In my view is there's going to be a lot of growth in the electrical grid industry, and so I think it's an attractive market for uh, for new talent. And one of the things that new talent. Um, it used to be in the old days, it was pay, benefits, job security, and then everything else, right? And w we talked to several utilities here, and e they all said the same thing, that it's, um, they're, ple they're pleading their case as, come join us, we were making a difference. Right. You know, it's no longer the old staid utility industry that you right. get in it, you stay 30 years, but come and make a difference. Whether that's data science, whether that's electrical engineers, whether that's, you know, people making transformers, right? come and make a difference, which is really true of, of the power industry, because right. electrification of everything is a huge change from carbonization right. used of everything. And they're all trying to figure out how to, we're yeah. at Distributech, and it seems like every major company here is trying to say, buy our system, right? right? Yeah, I, I think, <clears throat> I think the, the, the message is about decarbonization and doing something good for the, the planet, right? I think that's, that's how you sell it. And I think also to get the people, you have to take on the, what the high tech industry did to get people, right? You've got to make them, you know, have more of a, a some sort of equity share in what's happening here. And also, you've got to, from, from their standpoint, you have, they have to see a path where performance and reliability mean something important to uh, the, the utility. Like, like I said, uh, you know, um, performance-based rates drives that behavior. So it's one thing to say, well, we can't do something innovative because you know, the, the regulations are, don't support that or that don't support the investment. We've got to get rid of that blocker because through innovation, you're going to get the people that are going to run the future grid of the, of the, United, you know, of the world. I know you've, uh, H2Scan has hired a lot of people recently, a lot yeah. of engineers and a lot mm -hmm. of tech people. Uh, how was the difficulty of recruiting people uh, to, to H2Scan versus all of the other options? You're in California, right? Yeah. Okay. Was, was it hard? I mean. Yes, it was very difficult. Okay. And so that, I always got involved in every interview. I tried to, because the thing is, it's important for them to hear what we're doing to help the planet. And that was what, in, you know, engaged them. And it was also important for them to, to see uh, the technology and something of interest, right, that has multiple facets. Sensors are fantastic because it's 
physics, it's electronics, it's software, it's hardware, it's a diversity of applications, you know, from healthcare to energy. So to me, that sort of is attractive to, to people that are first entering the job market. They get a diversity of, of opportunities to learn. It also creates a great collaborative environment for people that are doing it together. Yeah. You know, they're, they're solving problems of the future together. Right. That's another thing that you, the you both utilities and suppliers to the industry talked about is collaboration. Right. Um, and that next generation, especially of engineers, loves to solve problems. That's yep. all we do as engineers, right? Solve problems. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The um, that's right about where we are now. When you look ahead, because your job as CEO is to look ten years down the road. What's happening ten years down the road? What are the storm clouds on the horizon that you think we should be dealing with? And particularly, I know you're a global company, but you can address it for Europe or address it here. Um, I think w one of the storm clouds is obviously uh, geopolitics you know, are driving things. I mean, what happened in the Ukraine ch dramatically changed the energy approach in Europe, dramatically changed it. And it caught people having to go to old, you know, coal to fill in gaps to figure out how to get new sources of energy and make it make the system reliable and you know meet the meet the demand to me that's that's something that you know is not you can't plan for it <laughs> you know you can have risk mitigation activities as a business but thinking about that that's certainly from a, a broad standpoint i see that there's a lot of like if you talk a storm cloud where it can move to um, i think the others well obviously uh supply chain is uh, ongoing storm cloud that we face making our electronic systems, you know, parts move from two weeks lead time to a year lead time. And, and if you make a complex system, you need a lot of parts. And the more you have, the more uncertainty you have and how long it's going to take you to deploy something, right? Because, you know, you only can deliver something to the part that arrives the latest, right? So it's not like getting them early doesn't help you if the one comes up late. And so I see that, I see that as a, a big, big challenge for everybody. Yeah, and it is. It's interesting you say that. The um, the people that we talk to that are transformer manufacturers. It, it had the same thing, and I said, "But it's copper and it's steel." And he said, "Yeah, it's copper and it's steel." <laughs> well, the, cop the looming copper crisis is yeah. also something that's a problem, and that's being partially driven by geopolitics, right? The shortage of copper. They expect the shortage of copper through 2030. So, get aluminum and transformers. <laughs> <laughs> aluminum and transformers yeah. have—it's uh, been—it's they're expensive, but now it doesn't matter if you need it right. and you can't get it, right. you'll take the expensive one. Yeah. And it's been a, it's a proven technology. It's a very strong proven technology. Uh, the storm cloud, the geopolitical, you can't predict. One, a politician wakes up and decides to do something, right? He's done. But as, as it relates to supply chain, one of the biggest issues we deal with is chip manufacturing. And as I understand it, a lot of chip manufacturing is coming back into North America because so many of them were in Asian countries. Right. Um, how does the chip shortage affect you guys, if at all? Uh, it does. Uh, we have a few uh, active components in our device that we have to source uh, from various vendors across the globe. And, uh, you know, the lead times on those can vary widely. So it, it is a challenge. I think, you know, um, you know, semiconductor companies, they operate on, uh, they have a business model that's basically they produce square meters of silicon. That's their job, right? That they. I like say it's like carpet. They sell you know a lot like of stuff. I'm going to use that. Sophisticated my, yeah, carpet. Yeah. But the, the end of the day, they look at where these chips have the most value. And I think sometimes you know those things end up in like automotive because of just the that chip. If I can't sell an automobile versus a two dollar part, that's a big deal. And it, and I think the vendors that aren't have that sort of criticality and that sort of buying volume get pushed to the bottom. So. You know, if you're not buying stuff in high volume, it's hard to get attention. And that's, that's a challenge for smaller companies. But in reality, uh, in the utility space, there's, there's, you don't make millions and millions of things, right? I mean, you make millions of transformers, but you know, the, it's not like you have 50 chips or something like that in each of these devices. So 
if you don't have a high purchase volume, you kind of get pushed to the bottom of the supply chain stack, which is a problem. Which, which is what we do too. If, right. Yeah, right. If right. You know, when you can talk thousands. I make thousands. I go, well, the chip guys say, I, I need millions, right? That's, uh, that's yes. the game they like to play. Yeah. Um, the last series of questions, uh, hydrogen economy. Um, I heard it said that the hydrogen economy is the future and it always will be, which is kind of a, the slap in the face. Right. Um, given the economics, given what's happening in Europe, just given the fact that we're coming to a realization of, and you see it here at Distributech, you see change, you know, you know, take charge of the change, you be the master of your change. Every big company has some big poster or, or video that runs about change management. Right. Um, so change is good, but, but change that's not corralled and change that is not um, shared. I'm, I'm just people, you can't just have one vendor do everything anymore. So you gotta have vendors talking to each other. You gotta have systems talking to each other. The hydrogen economy is gonna depend on that tremendously because there's a lot of people coming out of the woodwork at hydrogen conferences. They're right. yeah, talking about they've got the future and no one's got the future. They could be part of it, but no one has got the future. Is the hydrogen economy here? Is it still going to be the future? And it will it always be the future? Or can we start to see a major change in hydrogen as a fuel source, hydrogen as uh, a tool in industrial? Yeah. Is, is it happening now? Yeah, it is. Okay. I mean, it's, it's obviously, you know, the move an industry of this magnitude always takes time and people have to be patient for that to happen, but it is happening. And it's happening because hydrogen is a, you know, is, can be used for storage of renewable energy and things like this, but fundamentally you have an existing gas infrastructure. And because of the power delivered by the gas, home heating, so forth, you know, water heaters, all that kind of stuff, to do all of a sudden convert all that to electric, it'd be a huge, huge challenge. That would be a bigger problem to solve than deploying hydrogen in my mind. So I think the thing is, is that, you know, it's happening, you know, but you have this entire chain of events that have to all go together. Okay, you need people to produce the green hydrogen. You need people to transport it, to store it. All the designs, all the standards, all the regulations that support that take time to develop as people learn about it. And so it may not be happening as fast as the number of trade shows have grown around hydrogen, right? <laughs> but the reality is those things are important for the, the collaboration of the industry to coalesce on solutions that are, are effective and safe in the marketplace. So last question, since I've known you, you've traveled a lot. I mean, you've been to uh, the Asia Pacific, you've been to Europe several times, you do a lot of traveling here. When you, when you kind of get above the world and you look down, are all of our problems the same and are we beginning to work together to solve them? But do you see us drifting apart in our solutions? The, uh, the, the solutions of the manufacturers about what? Of hydrogen, the use of hydrogen economy. Um, I think it's pretty uh, ubiquitous across. I mean, it's, you know, there's projects in Africa we're involved in, there's projects in Europe, projects in Asia, there's projects in the US, South America. I think it's a pretty, I think everybody wants to get involved. And I think the reason they want to get involved is, is because they don't have to have oil in the ground in their location, location to get energy. They have renewables they can use, they can store it with hydrogen, so they can produce hydrogen as a product of, if they have a lot of hydropower, if they have a lot of solar power, if they have wind power, things like this, they can become an energy provider to the world. So in my mind, it's, it's like, it's, you know, oil is distributed in certain spots of, that people that happen to have their land there benefit from. But this is, can come from anywhere, right? There's, there's sources of energy that can be used to create hydrogen that can then be utilized on demand. And to me, that makes it ubiquitous to everybody. I think uh, I saw a, a LinkedIn or some, some little post from H2Scan. It said, we don't make hydrogen, we make hydrogen safe. I thought that was really good. So thank you for joining us. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Alan. Appreciate it. Bye, Dave. This has been an APC Technologies production, and we thank you for joining us. Our sponsors have been H2Scan 
and Distributech. And of course, the communities of APC Technologies, which is Transform Technology, Power Systems Technology, Green Energy Technology, and Women in Power Systems. So thank you. Mm -hmm.